the Life A Man's Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. We just thank you so much for provision. We thank you for blessings. And Lord, I just pray specifically that this message, uh, that the things that we're going to talk about here today, that you will infuse your wisdom into the words that I say to, to give me the right words to say on this topic. And Lord, we, we just welcome you into this time fully. And we want you to to be there for us. We want you to speak to us. We ask the Holy Spirit to move. And Lord, for this to get out to the people that it needs to get out to so that your glory can be revealed, but also so that your protection can be revealed and your grace and, and everything else. Lord, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us that we can see, but especially for the ones that we cannot. In your name we pray. Amen. So a little bit of a heavier topic today, guys. And so uh, I'm pretty sure I've never prayed on the podcast before, but that uh, it just felt like I felt like I had to with this one because uh, we're going to be talking about suicide and we're releasing this episode on Thanksgiving. So if uh, you are listening to this on time, thank you so much for listening to this on time and happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. I know uh, Thanksgiving's a little bit different this year for a lot of people around the world. Um, and there's a lot of things that are different for folks, but this is a topic, uh, the topic of suicide that I never really thought I was going to cover. And I mean, just add that to the list of things that I never thought I would talk about on this podcast in 2020. And then here we are, but really all of this came up because of the Unraveling podcast uh, that was released on the 9th of November. So if you're not familiar with the Unraveling podcast, that is another one of Jocko Willink's podcast. And so I think the original one was called The Thread and then, you know, some other podcast was already called The Thread and so he had to change the name. Anyway, so it's him and this other guy. I can't remember the other guy's name. And like the first five, six, seven episodes of the show, they were doing episodes on, you know, Jocko's time in the Middle East. And the other guy was also, I think he was in the army and he was in the Middle East. And so they were just kind of going over some dates and some things that were going on during that time. But then they've switched to some other topics, but their last topic that they did, it was called the unraveling 13 and it was called a people drowning. And one of the things that Jocko and his co-host talked about on that podcast is the the stats that were released by the CDC. That's the Centers for Disease and Control uh, here in the United States of America. And it was talking about deaths of despair and, and the statistics that coincide with that. And so basically 2020 sucks for a lot of different reasons. The main reason it sucks is because of COVID, but it looks like the deaths of despair from the economic problems and the subsequent you know, spousal abuse problems and child abuse problems and substance abuse problems that have come from the shutdowns, from this disease, from this virus that's going to have a over 99% survival rate, it was well over 99%, is causing way more issues than we ever could have imagined. And, And guys, no matter what article you read, and I'll give you some at the end of this, it's worse than what we can ever even possibly fathom. Because they're not doing a poll of every single person in America, and certainly not every single person in the world. There, there is some pain that's going on right now that people just don't really understand. But I listened to that episode a couple of weeks ago, but then a buddy of mine that I trained with from the forge, he's retired army. And he posted about a buddy of his that he was in the army with that killed himself. Right. So that, that was about a week ago, whenever I saw that. And then here, maybe just a few days ago, another buddy of mine who's in my foxhole, I go to church with him. Um, one of his former wrestlers, he's a wrestling coach, killed himself. And so I was thinking about talking about this on the today's podcast. And I even kind of broached the subject with some other guys, some other foxhole guys of mine, like, Hey, how do I kind of go about doing this? And, you know, this is a very sensitive topic and you don't want to mess this up. But then, you know, two buddies having buddies that killed themselves. It's like, okay, something's in the air that there's something going wrong. I even talked to a guy the other day, a university close by here is Oklahoma state university. They had four suicides from students. And that that's not common to have that many. And, you know, we hear about these police forces that were usually dealing with one suicide every week or two. Now they're dealing with five or six a day. And so it's something that I feel like we should definitely talk about. But for some of you, they don't, you don't really understand that this really is an epidemic, like, like a real epidemic. Like this is way more real than systemic racism. This is way more real for a lot of people than, than what COVID-19 is going to be causing for them directly because they don't have any comorbidities or anything like that. But the CDC had a report that they put out through the National Institute of Mental Health. And I just want to kind of go over some statistics for you because I was surprised to hear a lot of these. I didn't know this, but let me just kind of run through these here. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in people aged 10 to 34. Let me say that one again. Suicide. Number one is accidents, by the way. Suicide is the second leading cause of deaths in people aged 10 to 34. 
We have 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds killing themselves. Second leading cause, leading cause of death. It is the fourth leading cause of death in people aged 35 to 54. Suicides have increased by 35% from 1999 to 2018, 35% increase in a 20 year span. Suicide rates among males uh, is about 3.7 times higher than that of females. Among males, the suicide rate was highest for those age 75 and older. That was about 40 per 100,000, which is a lot. Uh, and in over half of the suicides in the United States, a firearm was used. Um, then there's some other stats that didn't come from the CDC or the National Institute of Mental Health, but just different things that I found uh, throughout the internet and some things that I've been able to corroborate is that military veterans have double the suicide rate of non-veterans, right? Uh, there are more active duty soldiers that have died from suicide than in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. Just think about that. I mean, because we, we're not having these overwhelming numbers of, you know, killed in action over in Iraq and Afghanistan, but more soldiers have died from suicide, whether on deployment or back here in the States, then have died in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. LGBTQ people uh, attempt suicide at three times the rate of non-LGBTQ people. Veterinarians, so not veterans, veterinarians, you know, the people that take care of your dogs and cats. The suicide rates among male veterinarians are twice the national average. And among female veterinarians, the suicide rate is three and a half times the national average. So just a real quick thing, because I, I actually work with a lot of veterinarians and some of the stuff that I do. But Part of the reason is, is because these people don't make nearly as much money as you think they do. So that that's one thing. And then, you know, they're crippled with debt. A lot of these veterinarians get out of school with somewhere between a hundred thousand and 300,000 in student loan debt. And they might get out making, you know, 50 or $60,000 a year, right out of school. They have this insurmountable debt They're They have, you know, compassion fatigue because they're constantly having to deal with, you know, animals that can't tell them uh, what's going wrong. And, and they don't understand why you're sticking them with that or why you're putting them under or any of those things. You know, if you take your dog in to be euthanized, you know, that's your one dog that's being euthanized, but that might be the fifth one they've done this morning. They're around death all the time, but that is just a very interesting, you know, type of profession that people don't really think about when it comes to suicide. But then COVID-19 uh, and really the, the shutdowns, the government shutdowns, the economic shutdowns and, and all the other 2020 stuff, they're, they're making things much, much worse. So this was part of the report that was talked about on the Unraveling podcast. But during late June of this year, so just a few months ago, 40% of U.S. adults reported struggling with mental health or substance use. Okay. So about 31% uh, were, you know, showing signs of anxiety and depression, about 13% started or, or increased substance use, right? Uh, trauma and stressors related disorders, that was about 26% and about 11% seriously considered suicide. 11%. This is just a few months ago. And, and things really haven't gotten better. We've we've had a run up to a national election here in the United States. It hasn't been resolved yet. It's causing a lot of consternation and stress for some people that actually you know are fully invested in things going on there. But then I also saw this recent Business Insider article that I thought was it, it was an important quote that I wanted to bring to you. And then I'll let you read it all later. But I just wanted to pull out this quote here. Back in May, researchers from the nonprofit The Wellbeing Trust projected that the pandemic's economic fallout would lead to a median of 75,000 additional deaths of despair over a 10-year period. Deaths of despair are deaths related to isolation, unemployment, and financial struggle, usually by overdose, suicide, or alcohol or drug abuse-related illnesses. The term was coined by Princeton economist Ann Case and Nobel Prize winner Angus Deaton. But now, due to the economy's slow recovery and the lack of adequate investment in mental health funding, researchers who made that projection just a few months ago say that the number of deaths could be even higher, up to 150,000, okay? And guys, if you're wondering, just kind of an FYI, deaths of despair are the main reason why life expectancy in the United States has gone down for the third straight year. You know, we always just assume that the life expectancy was going to keep going up and up and up because it just has, it's done that for decades and decades and decades. You know, it just continues to go up. This is the first time we've had three straight years of the life expectancy going down since 1915 through 1918. Think about that over a hundred years ago. And, and guys, that has a lot to do with, with suicides, but also opioid addiction, a lot of different things. But to get more specifically into the subject of suicide, um, Suicide happens for a lot of different reasons. And then we'll get into kind of the meat of why we're even talking about this today. But guys, you know this, you've, you've maybe felt this, you've experienced this, maybe you've guessed this if you've had a friend that's passed away from suicide, but it could be mental illness. 
right? It could be legitimate mental illness, not, oh, I'm having a bad day, but like legitimate, definable mental illness. Also financial ruin, you know, which could come from a job loss. Maybe you made a bad investment. Maybe you, you know, put everything on the wrong horse or you put it on black and it should have been on red, but financial ruin, job loss, just generalized depression, whether clinical or because of some of the other things that have gone on in your life. Um, Think about a loss of a loved one, right? You lose a spouse, you lose a child, Uh, but betrayal, uh, maybe a spouse cheats on you. Maybe a business partner cuts you out of a deal. Um, just generalized hopelessness. When people feel like they, they've got nothing else to live for, they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, isolation, which uh, could lead to a lot of these other things. But right now you have a lot of people that are normally in community, but now they're sitting at home. Uh, people from chronic pain, you know, they suffer from lots of chronic pain, whether it's back pain or neck pain or an old injury, or, you know, they, they had a limb removed or something like that. And they're just constantly in pain and they just want to end it. Terminal illness. People get a terminal diagnosis. They feel like they don't have anything else to live for. Hey, I'm out of control when it comes to cancer, but I'm in control when it comes to, you know, what I do over here. Uh, but then there's just random reasons, right? There's stuff that I haven't even mentioned here, uh, that, that people decide that this is the best option for them. But when you think about the subject of suicide, what it does for me is it brings up several important questions that we all need to kind of wrestle with and and reckon with and and kind of think about. And the first question that came up for me is, how can the suicide rates be this high in the United States and across the globe, frankly, when life is this good and easy? And I know that might sound like a ridiculous thing to say in 2020, because a lot of you are struggling, right? Like, Like legitimate struggle. Like, don't know how we're going to make the rent. Don't know how we're going to pay the mortgage. Don't know how we're going to keep our business running, right? Don't know how we're going to pay for this or that, right? But in general, life in 2020, going into 2021 is pretty damn easy. I mean, again, I talk about this all the time, but most of us just go to the store and buy our food. We're not making our food. We're not hunting our food. You know, if you have a bad hunt that day, your family goes without food. Not many of us are living in that situation, right? Especially if you're listening to this podcast on your smartphone, you're probably not in that type of a situation, right? Most of us aren't worried about the tribe on the other side of the hill that's going to come over and steal all our women and kill all of our babies and kill all the men and, you know, set everything on fire and take our horses. Like, we're not worried about that. We live in a time and an age where I can grab a a device in my pocket and basically know anything that's ever happened ever anywhere. We we live in this overwhelming age of, of being able to, to just access things that our forefathers could have never even imagined. And yet suicidality is still incredibly high. We, We have to wrestle with that. Another question that it begs is how can we be this, you know, quote unquote connected and yet still have such high deaths of despair? Right. You know, you looked at Zoom. I can't remember what the numbers were, but Zoom went from, you know, this many millions of users to now this many hundreds of millions of users basically overnight because of COVID-19. We have FaceTime on our phones. We have whatever the Android version of that is. We, we've got, you know, ways to connect through Google. We have ways to connect through social media. We can stay connected with people. Right. It's never been easier to connect with grandma and grandpa. Right. Like really see them face to face and oh, look at your dog or look at your grandson or, you know, whatever. We're so connected, we're told. And yet we have so many deaths of despair. So many people feel alone, completely isolated, like they have no support system. And the last question this begs for me is, have you thought about suicide? And the reason that that came up for me and that question really came to mind is because I have which might sound surprising to you, so to some of you, maybe it doesn't. But I do want to kind of put some some context around that, you know, just in case there's any, you know, life insurance, you, people listening to this like, oh my gosh, you know, we need to put them on a different mortality table. When I say I've thought about it, it's not been an emotional thought. Like, oh my gosh, things are so bad. You know, I, I hate my father and my job's not going the right way and I wish my marriage was better. And gosh, you know, we've lost two kids and, you know, blah, 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 and all these things. Like, I think I'm just going to kill myself. That's never really happened with me. But over the years, I've thought about suicide in more of an intellectual capacity, more of just like an option, not, not like an option, like, okay, well, I can go to Arby's for lunch today. I can work out this morning or I can kill myself. Not, not like that. Not like I'm picking off a menu. It's more of just an intellectual exercise. So 
back in 2019, I talk about that like it's way back in the day. Last year it was not a great year. So your 2020 was my 2019 because I haven't had a horrible 2020 in, in a lot of ways, right? I've, I have a lot to be thankful for in 2020, but 2019, not so much. Things were, were going wrong in a lot of different capacities. You know, we lost another child. Uh, things weren't going right with, with some business stuff that, that my wife and I were doing. And I just remember having this thought because I have a lot of life insurance on myself, right? And just thinking, man, if I just wasn't in the picture anymore, my wife would be so set. Like, you know, I'm not doing a good job of providing right now, right? I don't feel like I'm providing in the way that's appropriate to me, you know, on up to my standards. So if I just wasn't here anymore, then I could take care of her in that way. She'd have a lot of money to take care of things forever. And, and, forever beyond that, right? You know, could she, she could make generational wealth decisions with that money. So that, that might seem odd to you that I would have that thought, but to some of you, that makes perfect sense. But, you know, in the interest of being, you know, completely honest and transparent with everybody, that has been a thought that has continued for me even up into, you know, today. And that has been a thought that used to come to mind once every few months. And then it would come up once every few weeks. And for the last pretty good period of time, it's come up every day and usually a lot of times per day. And I'm giving myself different scenarios now. It's like, oh, you know, I'm in the middle of a fight with my wife. It's like, oh God, if I was dead, I just wouldn't have to deal with this. You know, that kind of thing. Or, you know, something goes wrong with with a business, right? Or, Or with a sale that I was supposed to get or something like that. And then it's like, gosh, you know, I'm not going to be able to provide in the way that I wanted to this month. But if I was dead, you know, Kelsey and James, they're going to be set forever. You know, I I had those thoughts. And really, it's just for me specifically, I won't talk about you. For me specifically, it's like I'm not worth alive what I am dead or I'm not I'm not worth more than that. Because I know the numbers, right? Because I kind of come from that world. I know exactly what I'm worth if I die, right? To the penny, actually. And then I just look at how I feel that day or at that moment and go, well, (laughs) I'm nowhere close to that number. It's got a period in it, if that helps any of you guys, right? It's got some commas, but it's also got a period if you look at it that way. And so it's like, I'm certainly not living up to that. You know, I, I can't quantify that. I couldn't put that on a profit and loss sheet or I couldn't put that on a, you know, a business review and see that as a good, good move. And so the the reason why I tell you that guys is not because this is not a cry for help. Okay. So I I've told, you know, important people in my life, you know, some of these thoughts I'm having, again, they're more intellectual exercises than anything else, but it is something that it's like, okay, well, those that's probably not normal or maybe it is normal, but it's something that you have to get a handle on. So this is not a cry for help. You know, this is, this is not me reaching out to you so that you can reach out to me, any of those types of things. The reason that I'm saying this guys, and also I I don't want any sympathy. That's like the last thing I want in just about any situation, right? If I roll my ankle, I'd prefer no one saw it. So no one asked me, Hey man, is your ankle okay? Like I just, I don't want anyone's sympathy, but this is the reason why I'm bringing it up. Why why I spent time kind of giving you context around something like this. That is frankly, incredibly personal and probably none of your damn business. The reason why is because guys do not talk about this very much. They, they just don't. I've talked to what I can remember is off the top of my head, one close friend of my entire life that talked to me about his struggles with suicide and, and his plans. Like he actually made plans. He was going to run his car into a bridge and he just didn't for whatever reason. But I know for a fact that there are more men in my life that have struggled with thought, thoughts like this, with suicidal ideation, with maybe even making plans to do those things and got, you know, swerved a different direction for whatever reason. Thank God. But this kind of dovetails nicely into kind of what I talk, want to talk about. I want to kind of talk, uh, you know, a message to guys that are maybe in that situation or maybe some, some guys that have found themselves thinking about suicide. So if that's you in any way, shape or form, please, please hang on. Like I implore you, please hang on to, to this content and, and I'll get to some different things here in a second. But uh, this is a message right here just to guys everywhere. 
Okay. Don't assume, I'll give you a lot of messages, all right? But here's the first one. Don't assume that your buddies are okay. Just don't assume that. If your buddy normally trains jujitsu three or four days a week, but you haven't seen him in a month, maybe reach out. It, it might cause you to, oh, hey, I don't really have this dude's number. Hey, do you have this guy's number? You know, talk to one of the one of the teachers or professors or coaches. Hey, do you have this guy's number? I, I just want to reach out to him. Have you heard from him in a while? Is he training uh, at different times than I do now? Um, you have a guy that posts something kind of odd on Facebook. And you're just like, man, that doesn't, that doesn't really ring true. Like this doesn't really have the same tone that I'm used to from this guy. Maybe it's worth a phone call. Maybe you saw someone and they literally physically looked run down. And you kind of pull them aside and say, Hey man, is everything, is everything going all right? And I mean like, Hey, it's just me and you right now. So, so don't BS me because here's the thing guys is how many times have you experienced yourself or even heard about someone committing suicide? And it was a shock to everyone. It was a complete surprise to everyone around that person. Right? I mean, I hear that way more than I hear about someone committing suicide and how that was just kind of the logical outcome that everyone expected. Um, you know, there's a, a, you know, a friend of a friend kind of a situation whose mother has basically for decades now been threatening suicide has, you know, tried to commit suicide with pills. And, you know, she's had some, you know, actually trying to kill herself moments and some just, Hey, I'm just trying to get attention moments, cry for help moments, but she's cut herself. She's done different things. And so the thing was, as for a while there, it it got especially bad. You know, thank God she's doing better now, but I just expected one day to get a phone call or text saying, Hey, she finally did it. And it would have been a shock to no one, but Everyone else that I know of or know of a friend who knows a friend or something like that, it it was a complete shock. No one knew this person was dealing with whatever demons they were dealing with. I had a buddy, Gabe, in college that, you know, was kind of an eccentric guy. And, you know, he and I liked some of the same music, so we really got along. And then, you know, I just kind of, you know, he and I just kind of fell out of touch for a while. And the next time I heard about him, it was that he blew his face off, killed himself in his apartment by himself, discovered by his best friend. I mean. It was a shock. And so if you assume that your buddies are okay, I'm not saying there's blood on your hands. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying, but you might be the person that helps them out of the darkness. And it might just be by paying attention, by pulling your head out of your phone or thumb out of your butt or just, just pay attention. That's the thing for a lot of guys is life is just kind of happening around us. And we're just kind of me being through life or whatever. So another message to guys here is, and this really comes along with the last thing, is it's your duty, I feel like, as a man, it's your duty to say something, to ask, to pry, you know, to risk some relational capital, okay? Because some of you guys are like, oh, that's not really my business, and you know, I'm a, I'm a libertarian, so whatever you want to do, and you know, it, it is what it is, and I just don't want to make this guy mad, and maybe it'll be a little bit weird. But, but. If we fast forward to the end and it goes as poorly as it possibly could, you know, ending with them taking their own life and you compare it to the awkwardness of prying, the awkwardness of asking, the awkwardness of just kind of interjecting yourself into that person's life and risking them uh, getting mad at you. Wouldn't you take that over the other thing? Wouldn't you take that over them killing themselves? Again, I'm not saying it's your responsibility, right? Only one person can make the decision whether or not to kill themselves. Okay. And it's that person. But for you, it's your duty to say something. So inherent is that is your duty to notice. Another thing that I think would be important to mention here is if you're helping someone who is suicidal, or if you've stumbled upon a situation because you did ask, you did say something, you did pry, you did, you know, push your relational chips into the center of the table. I got some great advice from a counselor friend of mine. Okay. And, and I guess this is another way to kind of include one of the reasons why I was planning on not talking about this subject is because I'm not qualified, right? I didn't get to go to school to be a counselor. I haven't gotten crisis training or anything like that, but I had a friend of mine that listens to this podcast every single week. He said, Kyle, you may not be qualified, right? In terms of credentials to have this discussion with people, but you are called to this ministry and inherent in that calling, you're going to have some conversations that are outside your wheelhouse that are a little bit beyond your training, right? Beyond your schooling. But that doesn't matter, right? Because God can do a lot of things 
through people that have no priors, no, no training, no, no skill set for the thing that they're being called to help with. Right. But let me go back to the advice that I got from a counselor buddy of mine who does a lot of crisis counseling. He does family counseling, a lot of different things. Here's the, the advice he gave me. The, the first thing he told me is get them to wait a day. So if you've got someone that's like imminently thinking about taking their life, get them to wait a day. And the reason why he said that is he said that for most people that commit suicide, they're not in the logical part of their brain. They're in the emotional part of their brain. So as you probably know this, if you've ever argued with someone that's being emotional and you use logic, how does that argument normally go? I'm assuming that they don't go, you know what? You laid out a great case for why your position is correct. I'm just going to go ahead and stop my screaming and yelling and go ahead and just agree with you. Has that ever happened? Like in the history of humanity? No. But he said, again, if you're, if you're at that frantic place where you're thinking about taking your own life, you're being emotional, not logical. So that's not the time to point out to them all the logical reasons not to do that. Do everything in your power to get them to just wait a day. Just wait a day because emotions change, moods change. Another great piece of advice he gave me is just, and this is kind of more immediate advice if you're talking to somebody, is get them to focus on something right now. Like focus on something, a task or something right there in front of them. You know, he even, I I think the way that he framed it is like, you know, if someone's talking about suicide, doing all those different things, you might, you know, just kind of throw them a monkey wrench and be like, Hey man, let's keep talking, but can we go outside? There, there's something going wrong with, with my truck. It just sounds funny. I just want to get someone else's opinion on it. And all of a sudden they're following you to your garage for you to turn. Now I would say not, don't lie. I mean, but just get them to come outside. Hey, can can I get your opinion on a paint color real quick? Like, let's keep talking, man. But hey, come out here or, you know what? Hey, I I completely understand that. And if they don't have a substance abuse problem, maybe pour them a scotch and you two go just somewhere else. And then you start talking about the scotch, get them to focus on something right in front of them, right in front of their face. Another good piece of advice he gave me is he said, Kyle, life is like a wave. Okay. You're going to have ups and downs. Okay. And you have to destroy the suicidal thoughts, especially during the up times. Okay. So I'll come back to me as an example here, but 2020, like I've said, for, for me personally, and for my family, we've had a lot of really, really good things happen in 2020, right? We we've made some decisions that have gone well, and it just, it's kind of a carbon copy of what we experienced in 2019, but I'm still having these suicidal ideations, right? These, these aren't thoughts or plans or things like they're just kind of these ideations that, that just kind of come to my brain. But he said, it's very important to get control over those thoughts when things are good. Because all of a sudden when life flips, right? You know, when you're not at the top of the wave, but you're at the bottom of the wave, if you haven't destroyed that as an option, it all of a sudden becomes more enticing. Taking your own life seems like a better choice for you in that moment. And so for any of you guys that when you look around or when you look at your baseball card of your life and you're looking at the stats and they look pretty good, and yet you're still struggling with these thoughts, You got to get those under control. We'll get more into maybe some reasons or some ways to do that rather here in a second. Some other advice he gave me is that if they conclude that there is no reason to live, the person you're working with or or talking with, tell them that they don't know what living is going to mean later. So he's got a really good example of this because this was a horrible thing that happened about a month ago here in my community. There was a family, so it's a husband and wife, a daughter and a son, and the husband is a family counselor. He is known by all these different people, just a great family, like a genuine, loving family that has helped so many people. A crazy freak accident happened, and their home exploded. So they live kind of outside of normal city limits. And so uh, they had propane uh, as one of the main energy sources out at their house. And something happened. Uh, There was some sort of a malfunction that was part of the house before they even bought it, you know, after the investigation. But something happened and about seven o'clock in the morning. There was a spark and then boom, their house exploded. It looked like it got hit by an F5 tornado. So the wife and son uh, were bru- bruised up and beaten up a little bit, but generally okay. The husband had some unbelievable third degree burns and some other physical issues that came from that. But their daughter, I believe she was 13 years old, she died. Okay, just a horrible, horrible situation. Just think about yourself, guys. 
being a dad, waking up in the hospital, having no idea why you're there, and basically being told that your daughter's dead. There was an explosion at your house. Your daughter didn't make it. Okay. So my, my buddy who's a counselor is, um, you know, they're, they're friends. They're both counselors. But, you know, the, the guy who lost his daughter, he's going to my buddy for counseling sessions once a week right now. And at different points during those counseling sessions, he has basically admitted that he kind of wishes the whole family would have gone. Right. Like just take God, if you're going to take one, why not take all, you know, that kind of angry situation. And this is a guy that he's so positive. He He's in the hospital, you know, him and him and his wife are literally thanking God that they're able to, to work through this and work through their physical ailments because now that they can, they can share Jesus with the doctors and nurses that are trying to, you know, basically piece them back together. That's this family, right? Oh, they're just so thankful that they can share Jesus with these people. But, you know, in a, in a private setting, it's one of those things where it's like, man, th- this is so tough. Like, why, why, didn't, why are we all still here except for one? And in that moment, it, it's good to kind of say to these people, hey, I don't know right now, and you don't know right now what you're living for, right? But you have no idea what living later is going to mean. You have no idea the plans that have been laid out for you and how you're going to intricately work into those plans later. And so that's an important thing to help them think through. Another couple of pieces of advice that he gave me is that humility is key for these people and helping them understand that humility is key. Because again, we came into the world with nothing. We will leave with nothing. And we have to look at it as you know, focusing on what we do have and not the things that we don't have. And some of the times when you have someone that's very envious and and I have an envious streak in me, like, oh man, I kind of wish I had done as good as he did last year on on his taxes. And oh man, I kind of wish I had done that well in the tournament. I kind of wish, you know, whatever the thing that you're envious of, right? But it's, it comes from a place of being not, you're just not humble. Because you think you should have all those things for whatever reason. Some of my most embarrassing moments that I've shown around friends, it was just from this cocky arrogance about this should be better for me because it's me. I'm Kyle and things should just work out for me. And so there's a, there's a little bit of that, that narcissism that, that comes in to people and it, it kind of hurts them when they're trying to figure out whether or not they should keep on going. And the last bit of advice that he gave me that I thought was great is that you have to deal with pain in order to get stronger. And again, you you have no idea what your strength is going to be needed for because pre whatever you were going through, whether it's, you know, a family member dying or losing your job or whatever, you were this level. And now you're being elevated to another level and you don't know what for yet. So for those of you that are listening to this that have gone through pain, that have gone through loss and betrayal and depression and all these different things. And you came out on the other side, you're not the same. You're grizzled. You're calloused in a good way. You know, it's, it's like what we talk about a lot. We talk about resilience, right? Not just strength because strength goes up and down, but resilience is something that sticks with you as long as you keep working at it. But I want to transition this as we, we kind of work towards the, the end of our, our show here. And this is a message to people listening to this, and maybe you are feeling suicidal right now, or you you have had suicidal ideation recently, or it's something that you struggle with in the past, or someone in your life is dealing with it, but, but mainly I, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you specifically, okay? And if this doesn't apply to you, keep listening, okay? But the first thing is, direct message to people that are dealing with this, is to give thanks. This is on purpose, releasing this episode on Thanksgiving, okay? But when you're giving Thanksgiving, when you're giving thanks, what are you giving thanks to? Because Albert Moeller uh, said this on one of his episodes this week on his podcast, is that the gift implies a giver. So when you're giving thanks for things, you have to think to yourself that this gift came from somewhere. But but even for me, since since I've wrestled with thoughts like this, Whenever I sit down and really think about it, I I can run off a a list a mile long 
Like I, I'm so thankful for God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. I'm so thankful, thankful for common grace. I'm so f- thankful that I, my life weaved its way to where I was able to meet Kelsey, my, my bride at the age of basically, I was 18. I just turned 19 years old. I'm so thankful for baby James. I'm, I'm thankful for the forge in Edmond, Oklahoma, the ability to train jujitsu. I'm thankful for a body that is, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm hanging on by a thread, but a body that works, a body that allows me to, to lift weights and, and run and do jujitsu and all those things. I'm thankful for my foxhole. I'm thankful for those guys that I'm doing life with on a daily basis. You know, I'm thankful for the guys that can snatch me up by my shirt if I'm doing something wrong. I'm thankful for those guys. I'm thankful for books. I'm thankful for, for podcasts. I'm thankful for your you guys, for, for this audience. And guys, I could keep going. But I'm not thinking about any of those things when I'm having those thoughts about like, hey, wouldn't it be better if I was just gone? Because I'm only thinking about the negative. And so if you find yourself in that place, force yourself to rejigger your mind. Take that thought captive. Take that thought captive in your brain and make it accountable to Christ. I think that's 2 Corinthians 10.5 or 1 Corinthians 10.5. But, you know, take every thought captive and make it accountable to Christ. Because you should be focusing on the good things in that moment. Because we all have them. Uh, Another thing, and this is a a more pragmatic and a more direct thing, is if you're having these struggles and you really feel like you're going to be a danger to yourself, call a hotline. Here in the United States, we have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. That will be in the show notes. You can find it with a quick Google search. These people have saved countless lives just by helping people talk through what they're feeling at the moment, okay? Another thing is just to phone a friend, right? Literally just call somebody. I mean, dude, like... Treat it randomly. If you want to put God to the test, literally just brrr through your contacts and boom, click on one and call that person. And if they don't answer, call somebody else. Just phone a friend. Don't feel like you're having to fight this alone. Which kind of goes into my next bit of advice is to get into community. Again, get into a community that if you're missing, they will notice. That if you seem off, they will ask you about it. This is why I, I bang the foxhole drum all the time to, to, to know and be known, to be in real community, right? Not like, oh, you know, once a year I go out and play golf with these same guys from college or, you know, uh, a few times a year, me and the old frat guys get back together to have a few beers. No, no, no. Real community, real community that meets often that the decisions you make don't just affect you. They affect them directly too, because that's how closely linked you are. And for some of you, you're in isolation right now, but I'm telling you what, I'm training jujitsu, right? I'm, I'm taking the risk of driving a car and the risks that come with that and potentially rolling around with guys that might have this virus or that virus or some other thing like that because community and training is that important. And if it wasn't that, we would do something else. My foxhole guys early on in COVID when, you know, we thought COVID was sitting on our UPS boxes and, you know, flying through the air like a missile directly into our nose. When we were having those situations, we had Zoom calls. You know, they didn't last for very long because we kind of, we found ways to kind of get together and socially distance and work out outside and do all those types of things. But we did Zoom calls to stay in community because it was that important. And the other thing, and for a lot of you guys that have listened to this for a while, you, you saw this one coming a mile away, but cultivate manly resilience. If you're going through the, these thoughts and these situations, cultivate manly resilience, spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. I, I don't normally give, you know, I don't normally send people to this because they normally find it somehow, but go and do our 21 day devotional on version. So download the YouVersion Bible app or go to Bible.com, YouVersion.com and search for Undaunted Life, a man's devotional. It's a 21-day devotional. It's a week on spiritual resilience, a week on mental resilience, and a week on physical resilience. And just start there and dedicate yourself to finish. Because guys, if you're going through crap, I'm not trying to minimize the crap. I'm trying to elevate the amount of resilience that you have in the face of that. You probably heard Jordan Peterson talk about in his clinical practice, whenever someone had a phobia, like a real gut level phobia of something, the goal of their counseling sessions was not to decrease the level of fear in these people, but to increase their level of courage. And that is the best medicine in those situations. The same thing here, right? Because the things that you're going to do 
may may not even have a direct effect on the things going on around you that aren't going the way that you would want them to go. But you can build your resilience. Because guys, I talk about this all the time. We talked about this last week, you know, jujitsu on Sunday with my foxhole guys. It's, it's about making deposits in the right bank account. So for physical resilience, for guys that, you know, just can't find a way to get in shape or can't, you know, stick to a program or, you know, can't, you know, push through during the hard parts of workouts. It's because their brains are weak. They're not calloused over. They don't have tens or dozens or hundreds or thousands of times when they were so exhausted, they wanted to quit. And they just said, nah, bro, I'm gonna do one more. I'm gonna run 10 more. I'm gonna do a hundred more of these. And it's just about making those deposits and making those deposits. When your alarm goes off in the morning and your bed's comfortable and it's warm and your wife's there and and everything is serene and and you can just hit that snooze button and go right back over, you do the opposite. You make a deposit in the other bank account. You roll your butt out of bed, you put on your running shoes and you go hit the pavement. Or, you you know, you get your gym bag, you get your keys, you get in the car and you go to the gym. You, You do something. And you make a deposit in the right bank account. That's how you create resilience. That's how you cultivate manly resilience. And another message I just want to give to you guys is that there is hope. And if you've listened to me for for any length of time, I mean, what is this, 160 something episodes in, you know, I'm not a big like hope guy. I'm not a big like, oh, it's all going to be okay. And there's rainbows and unicorns and we're just going to be just fine. Like, I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. Go to your, your local mega church pastor if you want that nonsense garbage. But guys, there is hope. There, there absolutely is. And I just did even a cursory glance through my brain and through the internet to find scriptures that directly speak to what you are going through at this exact moment. So just listen to these. Listen to what I'm about to read to you. And if it doesn't land immediately, you know, hit that 15 second rewind, go back, back, back and listen to it again. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Psalm 34, 17 through 20. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. And and guys, this last one here, if you're thinking about taking your own life, I got news for you. It's not your life to take. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. It's not yours to take. Again, if you want to hear that truth, just just rewind back. It's all over the place. There is hope. And the last message I have for you guys is just pray to God. And for some of you, that's going to be weird because you're not prayers, right? Maybe you consider yourself to be, well, I'm I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. So prayer is kind of a weird deal because you don't know exactly who you're communicating with. And let's say you're on the fence. You don't even know if there is a God. Let's just pretend. Pretend he's there. Pretend he did design everything and he's hearing you. Pray to God for understanding, for wisdom, for strength, for resilience, for a friend. Pray uh, for a way out of the depression and isolation. Pray for just a ray of hope. Pray just for the next hour, for the next day. Lord, please just get me to tomorrow morning, right? You know, you guys, a lot of you guys have heard about buds, you know, with SEAL training and all that. And the guys that are able to get through that six months of hell to get into the Navy SEALs or really to get to the next step to becoming a Navy SEAL, a lot of them just focused on getting to the next meal because they knew the guys had, no matter how much they tortured them, they had to feed them three square meals a day. So just make it till breakfast, just make it till breakfast and then just make it till lunch. Just make it until dinner. Just make it until breakfast tomorrow. But pray to God for the strength to get through. Because for a lot of you guys, you don't have it. You don't have it in the gas tank. But God can help you. God has a plan for your life. And again, this isn't some, you know, conspiracy theory. This isn't some sort of, you know, 
you know, listen to me and all your things will be fixed. This isn't some, you know, self-help book. This isn't, you know, some prosperity gospel nonsense. God has a plan for you. I'm talking directly to you right now, the person listening to this. There is a plan. And that plan cannot be done if you take this rash action. And and for any of you that are maybe dealing with other issues or with, with other people in your life that are going through this right now, just let them know that they're not going to be able to see what God has in store for them if they take this way out. Call it cowardly. Call it, you know, the inability to kind of you know work through the situation at the moment. But we all know that it's not what God has in store for you. So I'm imploring you. If, if I'm the guy you need to reach out to, info at Undaunted Life. That's the email, I-N-F-O at Undaunted Life. Just reach out to us, okay? We're not going to do our normal quick resilience boost on the way out of here. I'm going to make sure you guys have the suicide prevention hotline in the show notes. I'm going to make sure you have uh, the, the information, the statistics from the websites that I brought up, the articles, all that's going to be in there. You, you guys know my normal closing. If you, if you don't know it, go to other episodes. Who gives a crap? But guys, I'm here for you. I I can almost guarantee that there are guys in your life that are here for you as well. That there are family members that are here for you. They may not be qualified. They may not have all the right answers. They may even lead you down some paths that, that aren't the best. Please don't take your life. Know that there is another way out. That there are people that love you, even if it doesn't seem like it. That your life is valuable. And even if it's not valuable to you, it's valuable to God. And that's good enough. Guys, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for sticking with me through this this kind of rough subject and this heaviness. If you think this can be a resource to other people that are in your life that you think are struggling with this, please share it around to them. And we'll see you back here next week.